Hello everyone, my name is Rahul Doshi and I'm the Pillar Chief of Complex Arrhythmia Management uh, and Chief of the Cardiac Arrhythmia Group at Honor Health in Scottsdale, Arizona, Professor of Medicine at the University of Arizona. And it's my pleasure uh, today to speak to you about potential advantages of the Avair VR leadless pacemaker. Here my disclosure is relevant to the, pres uh, the presentation. I want to present a case that illustrates all the issues related to um, this particular device. This was a patient of mine who is a 39-year-old female with a history of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, prior ICD, prior transplant, and prior redo transplant. Had issues with rejection and actually also issues with chronic kidney disease, which of course uh, uh, creates a great deal of concern regarding vascular access. However, she's doing incredibly well. She's an athletic uh, uh, person. She actively uh, uh, competes in triathlons and has in fact demonstrated to have normal chronotropic competence. But she does, like we do see on occasion in the heart transplant population, recurrent presyncope related to sinus arrest or sinus pauses. This was demonstrated on an implantable loop recorder uh, and you can see here in the various panels multiple times where she had essentially periods of asystole, sometimes greater than 10 seconds. And these were, of course, associated with symptoms. So the considerations in her was leadless pacing to, for a lot of reasons, but certainly to avoid uh, vasculature and also in a young, healthy patient that's very active to avoid the complications of transvenous leads, specifically lead fracture. Um, she expected, she's expected to have a low burden of pacing, so that's another concern. Uh, again, we want to preserve the vasculature. Uh, but the main concerns in my mind were retrievability and, of course, a potential future for upgrade to an atrial-based device or a device to allow appropriate atrial sensing. This is just uh, some cines regarding her implant. You can see her loop recorder, the device is being advanced through the IVC. The middle panel shows engagement in the ap apical septum. In two views, you see an REO and then on the left panel an LEO view. And you can see here the device uh, location, both in REO and in LEO. And this is important because you can see that the device is essentially implanted on the apex. Uh, and you can see the reason for that, and at least in my mind. She has rather limited uh, real estate. You can especially appreciate that in LAO. And my concern was that I wanted to have the proximal portion of the device free to allow for the potential of retrievability in the future. And for this reason, actually, she had initially good thresholds, but she actually was seen to have a rapid rise in thresholds, though they eventually became stable uh, and acceptable uh, in terms of a safety margin. And the thought was that instead of repositioning the device further up the septum, which may have issues, of course, with uh, interaction with the tricuspid valve apparatus, or change the ability or decrease the likelihood of active uh, or of uh, potential retrieval, we decided to leave the device in place. And she's done incredibly well uh, post-device implant. This was actually the first case of an active fixation leadless pacemaker in a transplant patient. And this was actually also the first case implanted in the Avair VR uh, IDE clinical trial. Pacing for syncope or leadless pacing for syncope has been demonstrated to be as efficacious as transvenous. This is analysis from one of my fellows previously from the legacy nanostim device, uh, which showed that patients, of course, are, are younger, have less comorbidity and less uh, requirements for pacing. This has been demonstrated in a larger series with, uh, with leadless pacing in general, uh, including uh, the micro device. And so, leadless pacing is important in this population, but again, we have to think about in this younger patient population with low, less comorbidities, the ability to retrieve. So I would make the argument to essentially conclude that it's important to just like transvenous implantation, consider the long-term effects and the ability to retrieve a device, not just putting it in, and I would conclude that this device has been demonstrated to have outstanding acute safety and efficacy. There are significant advantages in being able to look at traditional pacing parameters acutely before fixation, including battery longevity, uh, ability to assess prior to fixation, and the accelerometer. The device has designed to be retrieved. The proof of concept has been demonstrated. Uh, and this device has outstanding six-month parameters. And with that, I'll conclude. And thank you very much for your attention.